coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. That's Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 19 to 24 today. And in this passage, we find Jesus in his great Sermon on the Mount saying some very interesting things. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know, this week I was reading an author named Lois Tverberg, who was writing about Jesus' Jewish background, and she has been so transformative for me in helping me to understand the Jewish world of Jesus. And she, in her book, mentions the old children's book series, Amelia Bedelia. <laughs> Do you remember those? They're about this housemaid named Amelia Bedelia, who always tries to follow the instructions of her employer to the letter. But she always does the wrong thing because she always follows them in an overly literal way. For instance, when her employer asks her to dress the chicken, she sews a tiny pair of overalls and fits them onto the bird. <laughs> when she's told to put out the lights, she unscrews all the bulbs from their fixtures and she hangs them on the backyard clothesline. And it's amazing how even little kids will recognize these mistakes that Amelia Bedelia makes because she doesn't understand the way that language works. And you know, there's a lot of these types of expressions that we use every day or often that would absolutely confound Amelia Bedelia. Expressions like kicking the bucket, or bite the bullet, or break a leg, hit the hay, burning the midnight oil, it'll cost you an arm and a leg, spill the beans, catch my drift, you hit the nail on the head, it's a piece of cake, don't cry over spilled milk, or get someone's goat. <laughs> I mean, you can really picture Amelia Bedelia literally jumping through hoops or trying to break the ice, all because she doesn't understand how language works. Now, you and I make similar mistakes when we read our Bibles, not because we don't understand the words, but because we often don't know when we are reading an idiomatic expression. Hebrew is laced with them, just as our language is. But what happens is that they lose their meaning when they're translated into Greek. And so when they're translated into English, they are also meaningless. And such is the case with verses 22 to 23 of our passage today which reads, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You know, these words have invited all sorts of speculation over the years. 
Um, Tverberg points out that one New Age teacher, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, interprets them as meaning that right in the middle of your forehead is a third invisible inner eye that is the key to spiritual enlightenment. Another person believes that Jesus was calling us to perceive our oneness with God's divinity. But countering these ideas, one pastor teaches that Jesus was simply speaking about having healthy vision, encouraging his listeners to appreciate their ability to see. Now, of course, all of this is not true because Jesus was not a New Age guru, and nor was he a modern Western pastor. No, he was a Jewish rabbi. And it's only when we put his words back into their original Hebrew context that they then begin to make sense. Because in the Hebrew language, you use the word I to describe a person's attitude towards others. You can have either a good eye, as we see in verse 22, or a bad eye, which we see in verse 23. And having a good eye, ayin tova, is to look out for the needs of others and be generous in giving to the poor. But to have a bad eye, ayin ra'a, is to be greedy or self-centered, blind to the needs of those around you. And so good eye means generous, and bad eye means greedy or stingy, or self-centered. Now, Tverberg pointed out how the Greek text of Matthew 6, 22-23 literally contrasts an eye that is hapless, or single, with one that is paneros, bad. And she writes that often people assume that Jesus was preaching about being single-minded, or sincere. But a single eye is not an idiom in Hebrew for sincerity. More likely, since Matthew's Greek readers wouldn't have understood good eye any more than we do, he translated it using haplous. Because in Greek, haplous was an idiom that meant generous. In 2 Corinthians 9.11, Paul tells the Corinthians that God has enriched them so that they can be Haplots, meaning generous. And you can find the same expression in Jesus' parable about the farmer, who, remember, hires all these workers all day long and then pays them all the same wage at the day's end. When the early workers grumble, what does he say? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or is your eye bad? because I am generous. Now, both expressions also appear in the book of Proverbs, where it says in Proverbs 28, 22, the stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. But in this line, the stingy is literally, in Hebrew, a bad eye. Now, look at Proverbs 22, 9. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. And here, the generous is literally, in Hebrew, a good eye. And so Tverberg says that even today, Hebrew speakers use these idioms. In fact, in Israel, a fundraiser for a local charity, he might knock on your door and say, Ten bayin yafa, which means give with a beautiful eye. Another version of the good eye. Now, remember how a number of weeks ago, we talked about how in Hebrew, verbs that in our language only refer to a mental activity carry in Hebrew an active element as well. Well, the reason that they see the noun I differently than we do is because there is an active element in their verb see. In Hebrew, to see something means more than just to observe it. It also can mean your attitude or your response to someone. 
It ties together the mental activity of physical sight with its expected physical outcome. That's why in Hebrew, to see can also mean to respond to a need. Remember last week we talked about how Sarah sent Hagar and her son Ishmael away into the desert. And Hagar and her son are both on the brink of death because they are lacking water. But then God hears their outcry and opens Hagar's eyes to see a well of water, the source of his provision. But remember that this was the second time that she had been sent by her mistress Sarah into the wilderness. The first time, after she became pregnant, Sarah saw that Hagar was looking down on her. And so she mistreated Hagar and Hagar fled. But God met Hagar in the wilderness and told her to go back to her mistress Sarah. But before he does that, he gives her a promise, saying in Genesis 16.10, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And then it says in verse 13 of Genesis 16, Then she called the name of Yahweh, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him? who sees me. Therefore, the well was called Bier Lahai Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Bier Lahai Roy means well of the living one who sees me. You'll remember that last week we also talked about Abraham, who's about to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. But what happened? It tells us that God provided a ram to take Isaac's place on the altar. And then remember what Abraham did afterwards. He named the place. What did he name it? He named it Yahweh will provide. And that's a good English translation. But in Hebrew, it literally says Yahweh will see. You see, in both cases, with Hagar and with Abraham, God actively saw. He actively provided for them. And what they saw was that God has a very good eye. He is an extremely generous provider. He sees. Now, what city eventually came to be built on top of Mount Yahweh will see? Jerusalem, the place that centuries later another human sacrifice would be offered and this time would be carried through to completion. But this time it wouldn't be an offering given by mankind to God, but an offering made by God himself for mankind as he offered his very own son Jesus on the cross as his provided means of salvation. In the very place called Yahweh Sees, Yahweh Provides. If you've ever sung Jehovah Jireh, my provider, you're actually singing, God will see. And so there's a lot of background to this concept of having a good eye versus a bad eye. And Jesus isn't alone in using that expression. There have been a number of other rabbis and Jewish teachers who have also talked like this. In fact, only a few decades after Jesus, Rabbi Joshua declared that a bad eye, an evil inclination, and the hatred of humanity drive a person from this world. And he too preached that selfishness and greed destroy our lives. Another Jewish teacher Yohanan ben Zakkai, who lived A.D. 30 to 90, he queried his disciples, what is the very best path to take in life? And the first answered, having an ayin tova, a good eye. Another said, being a good friend. A third said, being a good neighbor. 
yet another being wise about the future. But the last replied, having a good heart. And that final response, Zakai declared, was the wisest because it included all the rest. He said, if you have a good heart, you will have all the other things, including a good eye. You know, I have sat with many church members over the years in various hospitals who have dealt with very serious heart issues. And what has always amazed me is the slew of tests that doctors will often put you through to evaluate exactly what is going on in your heart. And I bring this to our attention because the Bible also gives tests for the spiritual condition of the human heart. And one of the chief ones, which I'm noticing all over the place in my reading of the scriptures this year, is how good we are at helping the poor and the needy. It's one of the most fundamental themes in all of scripture. And that active compassion is to flow from a generous heart, a person with a good eye. So how good are our eyes? Are we generous? Do we recognize that when God gives us things like money or gifts or whatever, he often doesn't intend for us to be the end recipients of those gifts, but rather channels through which he can bless others? That's something God's been challenging me with, and I hope he's challenging you with as well. We need to be people with good eyes so that through us, people will experience exactly what Hagar experienced, that God truly does both see and love them. And so let's be agents of his generosity this week and every week. Let's do so. Amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the Bread of the Presence of God.